The Florida Panthers got great goaltending from Sergei Bobrovsky and managed to beat the Edmonton Oilers 3 to nothing in Game 1 despite being outshot almost 2-1. to one. We'll cover Game 1 of the Stanley Cup Final from both sides. Plus, Sidney Crosby is negotiating a new deal with the Penguins. We'll have the latest. All this coming up on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Gil Martin here and welcome everybody to the Monday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. It is my pleasure now to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Florida Panthers, Armando Velez. And Armando, a good start for the Panthers Sergei Bobrovsky shines as they shut out the Edmonton Oilers in game one. Let, let's start with Bob. What did he do so well to stop this very potent Oilers attack? Positionally sound, Gil. And this was for, for Sergei Bobrovsky. I mean, going into this one, I, I mean, complete after game one of the Stanley Cup final, just looking back at all his game logs, he has just as many games where he's faced 30 shots than he, than he has face shots in the team. So this was a little bit this was a little bit of a different start that Sergey Bobrovsky had as throughout the playoff run, Sergey Bobrovsky has not had to carry the Florida Panthers first of all just like um unlike last year where he was the con spice favorite going into the Stanley Cup final against Vegas. Maybe that has changed this time around. Hey, sometimes you save your best for last, and so far it's a good start for Sergey Bobrovsky. Stopped some breakaways, two, three of them uh, for the Edmonton Oilers, too. And, I mean, when the top line was really pinned in their own zone based on that McDavid line, and also when you put up dry saddle on that top line, too, I, I mean, for also credit to the top pair of Forsling and Ekblad for battling it out in front of the, in front of the net not allowing mo uh, second chances for the, them too. So that's another thing about the re the rebound control was great. And even when there were rebounds, the, the Panthers were there to clear it out and get some quick outs of their own zone. Talk to me about the four check, because a lot of the time that McDavid line was backed up in their own zone. What do the Panthers do so well that caused that to happen? I mean, I mean, it's really about just building on on their size and and getting and fitting with that identity. I mean, you think about all the trades that that Bill Zito made, even when he first got here. I mean, the first move was Patrick Hornquist, a guy who's getting in in front of the net and and messing with goaltenders, getting to that net front. I mean, and then you think about trading for Sam Bennett, a big identity player for the Panthers forecheck. Thanks to that dump and chase for them, that's their that's their mo, and just getting that in order to get that goal for Evan Rodriguez, which is two nothing at the time. I mean, really, it's it's the Panthers just their ability to overwhelm and choosing their spots too, because this was the third game in the whole, whole entire postseason for the Cats that they had been on uh, outshot. And this was the first win that they had uh, th this this postseason too. So uh, it, a little bit different for them, uh, but for, for the Panthers, in order to just. Uh, and, and for for that for the Oilers, it was really them getting on the four check uh, to to start this game mo mostly. I mean, thankfully in the first and second period, they got goals early to to a little bit ease themselves in more going into the rest of the periods too. So that's another thing about getting goals early uh, in the in those first two frames. Couple of stats I wanted to run by you. First of all, eleven hits for Sam Bennett in this game. <laughs> Yeah, Sam Bennett. Uh, what what can we say about him? Created enemies in the Boston series and ended with a bang in the in the New York series too. Two of them were empty netters. Two of them were big goals for the Florida Panthers in that Eastern Conference final. Just a big part of it. And think about. And I also think about the balance in the lineup whenever he's in versus out because he's had a few injury um, issues uh, over the last few years. I mean his his style of play. Uh, it's it, for his style of play. 
hey, I, I mean, we'll take it for the Florida Panthers because it really it really fits into what they do. But I mean, whenever he is, you see the just the difference and just get, the way the Florida Panthers are able to gain the zone, battling pucks in, in the half walls. And, and, and in the corners, and then also how the Florida Panthers play the give-and-go game, too. So that's another thing about Sam Bennett just being – fitting so well uh, for the Panthers. And they they traded him for two second-round picks, too. So that's a great thing. Yeah, good deal there. And then the player who led the Panthers in block shots in game one, Alexander Barkov with four. Yeah, I mean, you're facing up against that McDavid line for for them too. So that's another thing about just needing to be physical. And then whenever the puck is on the blue line too, the Panthers' ability to just get to just have active sticks too, to especially for the first and third period, which is the which is the which is on their end, they're closer to their benches. They're able to get those quick outs and to still roll all their four lines too. So that's another thing. When you look at the time on ice for McDavid and Dreisaitl, I mean, it's a few minutes more than Alexander Barkov and Sam Reinhardt, guys who also play penalty kill minutes too. I know the penalty kill guys aren't there for as long as the the power play one for the opposition too, but the fact that the Panthers took more penalties in in, in game one of the Stanley Cup final and and the Panthers were still able to get under the, um, the, the two superstars too of the Panthers were still able to get their minutes uh, too. That's a very, very big luxury for the Florida Panthers go – as as they got game one hey and even mcdavid even said for maybe that's just puck luck for what happened in game six against dallas but i mean for, for the panthers just being able to still be optimistic um, be uh opportunistic excuse me and, and knowing that this is maybe not the style of win that you would want as 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 they're still as this game as this series is still not over far from it now Obviously, almost two to one in shots on goal in favor of Edmonton. What concerned you most about what you saw in game one from a Panthers perspective? Uh, I would say I would say the the forecheck and and the fact that the top line didn't really get too much time in time in there in the Edmonton Oilers end. But I think about when when you have the speed of, of McDavid uh, there for for the Panthers and the ability to just gain the zone and 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 just speed. I mean, you see him circling around over and over again. You have, but the, for the Panthers, the fact that they know where he is on the ice, that has really, that, that really for the Panthers, they were aware and just taking away those cross ice passes for McDavid too. So, I mean, maybe that's going to be a theme throughout the whole, whole series. I'm, I'm it's, it's not, it's, it, it's going to have a lot of Panther fans on pins and needles that way when they see the best player in the world doing that too. But I mean, so far for the for the Florida Panthers, I mean, two two, um, two points for Alexander Barkov, none for McDavid. But again, that it's also going to take just the bottom of the lineup too. I mean, the third line for the Panthers, I mean, they they were they they outpossessed the the Edmonton Oilers too when they were on the ice too. So the and you have Vladimir Tarasenko, a guy who play who's has the offensive capability of a top line guy, and and playing with that with the Lundells and the Lusterine, and so those are going to be the guys who are going to be dif- the differences, and also. The, the top PK unit for, for the Florida Panthers and Kevin Stenlin and Etu Lusterainen too. So th- those are going to be the guys who are going to get that matchup, especially with the top power play, which, I mean, uh, oh, but no power play goals in, in game one. So, I mean, and that's what, that's been the, that's been what has gotten the Edmonton Oilers, the success that they have had all, all throughout the postseason. I mean, you're looking at 30 straight penalty kills for, for the, for the Oilers, 35 of their last 37 for, for the Panthers. So, I mean, so far what we're seeing at five on five, I mean, you you got, you got, you got to be pleased, but not satisfied. So what are the keys for florida if they hope to win this series because e- even with the three nothing winning game one it clearly is not going to be easy it's going to come um, down to getting to the blue paint for for the panthers on Stuart skinner i mean look at look at both of their their first two goals for for them one off the rush on a quick out which the florida panthers were getting were that that top pair for the them was having a little bit of a hard time getting out of their zone, but thankfully for the Panthers, they they were able to just get those two go- one goal off the rush and then another one on the dump and chase. But you you maybe want to see more more of of eliminating that speed through the neutral zone so you could get, go out in transition and get the four check going to create the the under duress and those redirections out in in the blue in, in the blue paint because I mean if if you're testing Stuart Skinner in that blue paint and trying to redirections versus what versus what versus Sergei Bobrovsky, I, I'm liking the chances of, of Sergei Bobrovsky going into this one. But, 
I mean, so so far so good. It, it when you get when you get a win that maybe maybe some people thought that maybe Edmonton deserved. Talk to me about Carter Verhage, how clutch he's been in these playoffs. Five overtime winners since he's been a part of the Florida Panthers too. So it's a it's a, he's a he's in the company of uh, Maurice Rocket Richard and Joe Sackick too. So that's another thing for for Verhage. Not now bad. ten goals in the <laughs> ten goals in the postseason. The fact that he's done it in so many less games too. So he's gonna get a payday when he's a free agent in a in a couple of years. He'll be a free agent in the in the twenty twenty five off season for him. So. Just uh, the fact that him and Barkov has just have been together from the start. There's been some stints where he's been off that top line, but when whenever you need a goal the most, or or you and and knowing who he works best, and going back to 2021, him and Barkov are just uh, it, we we've seen Victor Kozlov and Pavel Bure uh, in the late 90s, but I mean with with the with where where this where the Florida Panthers are with Carter Verhage and Alexander Barkov it's really a great combination for them and hey it manifested in that first one just less than four minutes in absolutely Armando why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media they can follow the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts locked on Panthers and they could also follow me personally on on x at monoman12 and follow the show account on on X and Instagram at L O underscore F L A Panthers. And also we're, and also the Florida Panthers, South Florida is also home to three um, back to back to back ECHL champions um, and Kelly cup champions, excuse me, in the Florida Everblades. So South Florida uh, h- hockey, it's, 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 it's a great, it's great to be uh, in South Florida for the state of this sport. All right. Armando, thanks so much. Absolutely. Gil. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at FanDuel. Summertime means baseball, the NBA Finals, and more. You could bet it all on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you could use to bet everything from the NBA Finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park. And hockey fans, you could use your knowledge of the NHL on FanDuel. You could bet on who's going to win tonight's game two of the Stanley Cup final, who's going to win the series, or maybe even who's going to win the Conn Smythe Trophy as the playoff MVP. You can get all the latest odds on that and more at FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Oilers, Nick Zerreras. And uh, Nick, tough loss in game one. The Oilers almost outshot Florida two to one, had some great chances, but were shut out three to nothing. What's the biggest reason for this loss in game one? Bob, it's that straightforward. Bob Bobrovsky had been relatively quiet. He had a few nice games against the Bruins. He had one decent game against the Rangers, but this is very different from the Panthers team of last year, which was a lot more chaotic, a lot more dependent on Bobrovsky to make things happen for them. And he was fine. It's not like he was part of the problem or anything to this point, but that was the first really, truly dominant game Bobrovsky's had all playoffs. You go 0 for 3 on the power play in spite of all the good looks, as you mentioned, almost out shooting them 2 to 1. They peppered him. I mean, the first look of the game, Hyman has that look 15 seconds into the game, and Bob's already on his back. So you never want to take too much away from one game, especially one like that, where it's clear one player's just kind of on their game in a given moment. So you want to take a step back. You want to breathe. It's very frustrating because by all accounts, that's a game you should win. You had the looks. You just didn't beat the goalie. And that's going to happen. But you can't let that deter you. And you can't let that get in your head because we've seen that happen. You know, a great goalie gets into a rhythm and the other team starts trying to overpass the puck into the net, one too many passes, and they start losing what made them effective in the first place. I don't think we'll see that from Edmonton. I think they understand what it's going to take. Because otherwise, you like their game. They kept Florida on their heels for long stretches of the game. Florida's goals, a little on the ugly side, preventable mistakes, but that's going to happen. Florida's really good. So it, it's not just a an Oilers thing. It's not just the Panthers thing. It's how those two things are interacting, really. So I'll be very curious to see if Edmonton is able 
to keep the tempo the way it was because I do think that helps them. If the game is up and down, back and forth, kind of the way it was, I do think that helps them against a Florida team that individually talented, but if you force Florida's defensemen to actively play defense, I do think there'll be advantages there. Evan Bouchard officially had four shots on goal, but he had more than 14 shot attempts. What did the Panthers do to limit Bouchard's offensive effectiveness in this game? They put pressure on him. This is something they do a really good job of, of whoever's at the point. They get heat really quick as soon as they enter the zone. They did a really good job of this against the Rangers as well. Last round, putting pressure on guys like Adam Fox at the top, putting pressure on guys like Mika Zibinijad. So that's the key for Florida's game. If they want to put pressure on you and make you make a decision before you really want to. And I do think some of that is, I don't want to call it desperation, but you know they're down in the game. They need looks, and Bouchard has the puck and feels, okay, I can do something here. And that's really what it is. It's only game one. They weren't, tra they were trailing by two for a good chunk of the game, but a little desperation. You, you have a, you feel like you have a decent look. You want to put the puck on the net just in case, because you get the rebound, the deflection. You can, you can make more things happen just by throwing the puck at the net. But Florida blocks shots really well. You know, that's something Edmonton's going to have to do a better job of getting used to. It's something that I think Edmonton might have trouble with at times of, accepting they're going to have to cycle the puck and try and force Florida into breaking down their defensive structure. Because if you just let Florida get set up, it is really hard to break through. Connor McDavid, a minus two in this game, six shots on goal, had his chances as well. But uh, how big of a concern is it that his line gate was on the ice for allowing as many goals as it did? It's funny you bring that up because that happened quite a few times in the Vancouver series and in the Dallas series where you catch them and force them to play defense. That's really the only way you're stopping Connor McDavid is if he's on the ice and he doesn't have the puck a lot. There was one game in, in the Vancouver series where him, Hyman, and Dreisaitl played the entire game together and they finished the game a minus three. So that type of thing happens to them where if you put pressure on McDavid and Dreisaitl, make them play defense – that's how you slow them down. You're not really going to contain them. As you mentioned, a lot of shot attempts, especially on the power play where they run the power play through McDavid. So definitely something to keep an eye on. I thought Florida did a nice job of trying to force them into playing defense, of dumping the puck in behind them, forcing them to organize, regroup, and then break out. All you're trying to do when he's out there is delay it, make him work hard to create offense. And then if you get beat, you get beat. But I thought Florida did a solid job on him. But that's definitely a fair critique of McDavid and Dreisaitl in these playoffs, that on occasion you've been able to catch them by forcing them to play defense. And the first goal, that's a rush opportunity. Nurse and CC both missed their checks. They had two chances to break up the first goal, the Verhage goal. And then the third one, same deal. CC goes to the corner. They could have he could have killed the puck in the corner and it gets through nurse who, if he has a stick on the ice breaks up that pass. So I definitely think you can exploit McDavid and dry respectively by making them play defense. But at the same time, Florida's good. It's going to happen. They're going to get pressure and it's unfortunate. The goals happen the way they do because Skinner is a lot better when the Oilers are playing with a lead, when they play with a lead, he's a lot more comfortable. And I didn't think either of the goals he conceded last night were poor. No, but you want to give him a little bit of a chance to ease into the game. And I thought they did a good job of not putting too much pressure on him. It's just unfortunate they couldn't find the back of the net and kind of relieve some of that pressure on him. You know, we're talking about what was difficult for Edmonton, what went wrong, but what went right? Because they dominated the, the pace of this game for most of it. They had the puck a lot. They did a really good job. And this was my main concern coming into the series. They broke out of their zone really well. They got clean regroups. Something Edmonton does that not a lot of teams do is their forwards will often break the puck out of their own zone where they will come back around on a regroup, get possession, and then start building up speed through the neutral zone to try and get you know a real good head start of skating to put pressure on the other team in the neutral zone, force them to move around. I thought Edmonton did a really nice job of breaking out cleanly, not asking Skinner to do a whole lot, and not putting a lot of pressure on their own defense. Because if we're going to be honest, that's probably Edmonton's weak link in this series is they need to get from defense to offense quickly. Because if they have to actively play defense for long stretches, they're going to have a hard time. Last night, they did a great job of breaking out clean, 
getting to offense and forcing Florida to defend. That's really the key to the series in my mind is who does better in transition. You mentioned it. Florida was, excuse me, Edmonton, really good in transition, really fast. They had the puck a lot and the game had a really high tempo to it. Something that at times hasn't suited Edmonton, you know, in the Vancouver series, when Vancouver was going really fast, that was putting a lot of pressure on Edmonton's defense. But tonight, last night, excuse me, it worked out really well for them. They just didn't put the puck in the net. So what else has to happen for Edmonton to get in the win column and even this series up on Monday night? Going to need an ugly goal. I think that's the key this time of year, especially when you're playing a really good goalie. You go and look what Florida did to Shesterkin. You got to have guys in the kitchen all around him. Reflect deflections, rebounds, second chance. You're not going to beat Bob Clean for the most part, especially because as we just talked about, they block a lot of shots. You're going to have to find ways to get him moving left to right or traffic in front where he can't see it. And that's a tough ask. Florida is really physical down low. Their defensemen are well equipped to clear the crease. But if you want to beat a really good goalie who's playing well, you're going to have to find an ugly one. And that typically that typically gets the engine going. You know, once you get that one, you get, okay, we can score on this guy. Now let's keep this going. That's the key for Edmonton. Just get one and you go from there. Do you think an ugly goal is something that you would see from McDavid or Dreisaitl or Hyman, or is that someone further down the the depth chart, so to speak, who might be able to spring that? Of those three, Hyman. Hyman does not. Hyman is the one guy who will go to the net front and he'll just eat the cross check over and over again to occupy that space because he knows if he stands there long enough, McDavid's going to find him and he's going to have a really good scoring chance. Last night he had, I would say, three or four really good looks and just couldn't find one. All right. Well, Nick, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they can find the podcast and where they can find you on social media? Thank you very much. Uh, Locked on Oilers every day. Going to go record an episode later for you guys for Monday. So you'll have that. And uh, on Twitter, at Nick Zararis, Nick, Z-A-R-A-R-I-S. Thank you very much, Gil. All right. Thank you, Nick. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show a familiar face and voice to Locked on NHL listeners and viewers. Hunter Hodes of Locked On Penguins. And uh, Hunter, the big news out of Pittsburgh now, negotiations going on between the Penguins and Sidney Crosby. Now, he still has, what, one year left on his contract. But what are we talking about with negotiations here? And, I mean, is this going to be more of a team-friendly deal or is Sid still looking for a lot of money? I mean, it could be a bit of both. I mean, Sid has taken below market value throughout his entire career, especially throughout this entire deal. If you remember, he signed this mega deal before the latest CBA. So it had like a bunch of different stuff in it that you wouldn't be allowed to have right now. I mean, it was a 12-year contract. You can't sign players to a 12-year contracts anymore, but he's been making 8.7 million per year. That's the AAV on the contract for throughout, or excuse me, throughout this deal. But I think for this one, you're going to be looking at, if I had to guess a three-year contract somewhere, you know, eight to 10 million per year. If he wants to ask more, I can't blame him. He's taken, again, $8.7 million per season for the last 12 years. And also, he deserves to make more money. So I really don't think this is going to be that hard of a negotiation between the Penguins and Sid and his agent, Pat Brisson. This should be very straightforward. I just hope that it stays pretty quiet because if you remember a couple years ago with the contract talks with Evgeny Malkin, those went pretty public at the closer you got to free agency. And that's when Gino and his agent got really mad at how the Penguins and Ron Hextall were approaching the contract talks. And then literally right before free agency started, they agreed to a big contract. So I hope it's just a little bit more quiet. But if I also had to guess, this is going to get announced on July 1. I really don't think they're, they're going to let this linger too much into the offseason. I think they're going to get this done pretty quickly here. And I think you're going to look at a contract three years eight to 10 million per season. But I also wouldn't be surprised if he just re-upped for 8.7 million per year, just because of how superstitious he is overall. But I think it's going to be a three-year extension for him. And do you think this is his last contract with the Penguins or maybe there's another one or two year deal after this? I think this is his last quote unquote big contract with the Penguins. I think after this, you know, he'll be obviously 
bit older. You know, he's going to turn 37 this year. So he'll be over 40 by the time that one is up. So I think at that point, you're looking at if he wants to keep playing, you know, a one year deal. And then maybe if he wants to keep playing after that, another one year deal. But he's not going to end his career with any other team, I don't think. And how important do you think it is for the Penguins to get this deal done at or close to July 1st? I wouldn't say it's like the most important thing in the world just because they have big needs to fill for this offseason, but you still want it squared away. I don't really want to head into this next season with Crosby and the whole talk being like, oh, this is last year of his contract. You know, what are the discussions going to look like? Oh, could he be somehow dealt at the trade deadline, which is not going to happen, even though we'll have to see if the Penguins make the playoffs next year. But I don't want any of that talk during the season. I would, it's important. It's not the most important thing, but I still would rather get it done sooner rather than later. And I do think it is going to get done pretty quickly. I don't think there's going to be a bad blood on either side here. There's no reason for there to be bad blood. You talked about the important moves this team needs to make, some decisions on players who are currently on the roster. Who do you think is most likely not to be back in a Pittsburgh Penguin sweater next season? Well, you know, you had Jeff Carter announce his retirement. He had a great career overall. Other than that, I mean, they don't have too many big UFAs this offseason. I mean, Jansen Harkins, who's on the main roster, I don't think he's going to come back. Goaltender Alex Ndelkovich. Now, the door, I don't think, has been fully shut on him coming back, but I would kind of be surprised at this point if he did. He's going to be looking for a contract, I think at least, in the two to two point five million per year range, and they already have Jari signed for five more years at five point three seven five million per year. If you add two to two point five million to that, you know you're getting close to eight million for two goalies. I'm not really too interested in that heading into next season. So I don't think he's coming back. Players that are currently on the roster, I would be a bit surprised if Riley Smith is on this team next year. He just didn't seem like a good fit for the Penguins throughout the season. He had a nice first month, but he really tailed off after that i could see a few teams out there looking at him as maybe a bounce back candidate on their respective teams so i think the penguins are going to do everything in their power to try and clear that contract out and get an extra five million salary cap space right now because of the salary cap going to be 88 million you're looking at them having a little over 13 million in cap space before it was looking like it was going to be a little under 13 million but because they get the extra 300k it's going to be about 13.2 million so if you can clear five million there you get over 18, which is close to what they had last year. They had about 20 million. You just got to, I keep saying on the show, you have to use it wisely and not just throw out a bunch of money at players who really aren't going to be that good of fits on the team. But, you know, outside of Riley Smith, there's an outside shot that they can maybe trade Raquel looking at his contract, looking at the production he had this year. And then obviously I think they're going to listen on Tristan Jari, but unless they can find a taker or unless they can also find an upgrade over him, I think it's, 70 30 that he does come back to the penguins so those are a couple of players that i could see them at least looking to move or listening throughout the offseason here now we know this team has missed the playoffs the last two years and we also know as far as negotiations with Sidney crosby they want to give crosby malkin latang etc one more shot at the cup so it's going to be more of a win now mode what is this team looking to add this offseason to to get them back into playoff contention? Yeah, I mean, I think they're trying to, you know, win now for this year while also looking to the future a little bit. Dubas has said he kind of wants to do a retool on the fly thing, you know, maybe trying to stockpile some more picks, which is why I could see them moving, you know, more than one veteran off this team during the offseason. But in terms of needs for this offseason, I think they very much need a third line center. I think that's their biggest need right now. I like how Lars Eller played this past year, you know, at 16 goals. But I think when you look at his age, I don't know if he's going to repeat that next year. And I think he serves this team better as a fourth line center. If you can get a third line center that can come in, produce, you know, 17, 20 goals, be a bit more of a playmaker, even a bit better defensively. I would be very much in favor of that. I think they could also use another middle six winger that can play up and down the lineup to give them a little bit more depth scoring. Those are, I think, are the two biggest needs for this team. And then if you have the money for it, potentially another top four defenseman. I, I look at the left side specifically. Marcus Pedersen's great. He has a, another year left on his contract. I think they're going to talk extension with him this offseason as well. And that's obviously going to be a high ticket, but it's still someone that I would sign back for multiple years. But yeah, after that, you have... Questions about P.O. Joseph. He's a restricted free agent. I think he's going to come back, but you never know. And then you have Ryan Graves. You know, Kyle Dubas, um, he didn't say he sucked during his press conference, but 
he basically did again without fully saying that word. He knows he needs to be better, a lot better for this upcoming season. I think they're going to give him another shot, but I still think when I look at that left side, it's vulnerable. And if you can get another top four defenseman to play on that left side, maybe by opening up some more cap space, I think that would also really help this team heading into next season as well. So those are the three big needs I have for this team heading into next season. And if you can somehow you know, potentially upgrade over Jari at starting goaltender, I would look at that as well, even though I think that one's a little more unlikely at this time. If uh, Jari stays and Adelkovich goes, what kind of goalie are they looking to add to back up Jari? So I think they could do something similar to what they did when they signed Adelkovich, looking at maybe some cheap options during free agency, even though the goalie market is not that good. They'll maybe try to go out, at least get a 1B cheap option. But if they don't like that, they do have Joel Blomquist down in Wilkes-Barre, there's talk that he might be NHL ready. He had a really great year in Wilkes-Barre this year. He hasn't played an NHL game yet, but they're going to, at least if they don't make a move in free agency to get a backup, if Ndelkovic walks, they're going to give Blumquist every opportunity to win that backup job in camp. So it's either going to be him or just someone similar to Ndelkovic that signed for really cheap last off season. All right, Hunter, it should be interesting. I know you'll have it covered every step of the way. Why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Yeah, you can get Locked on Penguins wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, Sirius XM, et cetera. You can follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. I host the show with Patrick Damp, my co-host. You can follow him on Twitter at Cinem for Wet. And we'll have another episode for you all on Monday. All right. Thanks so much, Hunter. Yeah, thank you. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On NHL podcast. I'm Gil Martin. I host the Monday edition of the show, and I co-host the Friday edition along with Rachel Donner. Uh, I want to thank my guests. I want to thank Armando Velez of Locked On Florida Panthers, Nick Zareris of Locked On Oilers, and Hunter Hodes of Locked On Penguins for joining me today. Don't forget, we are here every day, Monday through Friday, bringing you the biggest stories from around the National Hockey League. So make sure you join us for that. Until then, have a great day, everybody. Stay safe, and thanks for listening to and watching the Locked On NHL podcast.